know, never think that you don't have a voice. We all have a piece to play to make things better than we found it. Hi everyone, I'm MBA Chic reporter Tori Singer. We are very excited to be joined by Minda Hartz today. Minda is a workplace and equity consultant. She is also the best-selling and award-winning author of The Memo, Right Within, and most recently, You Are More Than Magic. So Minda, thank you so, so much for joining us. We have a ton that we'd like to dive into with you um, in not a ton of time, but we're so happy to have you with us. Thank you, Tori. Happy to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. So, Minda, I thought we could start with something that's a theme of a lot of your, your different works and a lot of conversations that you have. Um, and, and that is the concept of healing and freedom, specifically for women of color in the workplace. So I was curious if you could describe for us, what does that look like in the current climate in 2022? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I think about often is freedom and the definition or one definition of freedom is no longer feeling confined. And I think that women of color, women, anyone who feels like they're on the margin has felt confined inside the workplace that you can't bring your authentic pieces to your, of yourself to the workplace, that you can't you know, maybe use your birth given name because of people's you know, conscious or unconscious biases. And the more I started to think about that, if you're in any environment for too long, you are experiencing some sort of trauma if it's you can't be who you need to be in that space, right? Or you're not, Talk, you're not met with humanity, dignity, and respect. And so for me, I'm like, what could it look like if women of color were able to be free at work? And it would require us to heal in order to know that there could be better and what good looks like. And so I want us to interrogate what good looks like to us, not what good looks like to status quo. Absolutely. So important. And, and I know that, that you delve into that concept of maybe what what the norm quote unquote is, but what needs to be made right are two very different things. And, and something else that I find really important to unpack with you is the concept of chronic stress. I know you touch on that um, throughout a lot of your different pieces that you've developed. And I was wondering if you could delve a little bit further into the concept of repeated microaggressions um, could you give some examples of what those might look like or feel like when they happen specifically at work? You know, I think the, the reality is that the workplace that we all know it to be, we've normalized some bad behavior, right? And so we've just said, oh, that's just Jim being Jim or that's Connie being Connie. But if we really strip it back, are they causing more harm than good, right? By the things that they're constantly saying. So for example, I had a manager, we'll call him Chad for today. He said... <laughs> Um, after seeing that I had burnt orange fingernail polish on, you people love your bright colors. Now, some would say, oh, he didn't mean any harm. He was just complimenting your nails. That could be true. But when you use statements like you people, it tends to be demeaning, right? And not um, making the person on the receiving end feel good. And I feel like when you're a person of color, when you're a woman of color, you're experiencing that type of language, that type of behavior on a daily, if not hourly weekly basis. And if, again, if you've been in any environment for so long, after time, you start to hold on to that. You start to internalize that. And um, I believe that's how imposter syndrome starts to creep up. I also feel like that's where chronic stress turns into chronic illness, right? So if you're always in a fight or flight mode inside your workplace, because you're worried about is Chad going to say that thing in today's meeting, right? So you're already like bracing for it. And that's chronic stress to your body. That's trauma. And so nobody can do their best work under those type of constraints. And so I think it's important that we understand that two things can be true at the same time. We might work at the same place and experience that workplace very differently. So how can we remove that barrier for our colleagues that are experiencing that chronic stress on a daily basis? Thank you for that. I know that a concept that you also are passionate about is the process of healing. It's not overnight. It doesn't happen because you decide that you want to heal, right? There's a lot of factors at play. And I know that you spent 15 years in corporate America. Um, I was curious with your experience, your reflection, I know you've done a lot of self-healing therapy, a lot of different things to get to the place that you're at currently. Um, 
specifically for, I mean, for women, all women, but specifically women of color, maybe dealing with racism in the workplace, maybe dealing with those microaggressions you were just describing, what are your top tools to, to sort of have at the ready? Yeah, that's really great. And I, I want to just echo what you said that healing is not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle, right? And I left <laughs> corporate America in 2019. And so just because I left doesn't mean I don't experience triggers or trauma or whatever the case may be. I'm still working through a lot of that, but I realized that I'm, I put myself in a position where I'm not going to allow someone because of what they said or did stop me from my healing journey. And so number one, the tool that you have that all of us have is healing is a choice, right? We have to decide if we want to go down that path and for freedom, right? Again, no longer feeling confined. The other thing that um, I include in my book right within is something called the affirmation pyramid. And it's a quick, like five things. I'll just run it really quick. It's when something does happen and you have a microaggression or macroaggression in the workplace, sometimes you're looking for someone else to say something on your behalf. And sometimes you'll be disappointed if you're waiting on somebody else, but you have the power to um, take care of yourself. Right. And so one of those things is first to, um, pause because you don't have to respond right away, right? Um, you can take that in. Number two is you can acknowledge that harm has been caused to you. Maybe it wasn't their intention, but it harmed you, right? So the intent versus the impact, the impact is harmful to you. And so you don't have to normalize that. You don't have to say that's just Tom being Tom or Tom had a bad day. If it affected you and it's harmful, then let's name it. You can't move on if you don't name it. Um, the next thing is document because Sometimes we question if these things are the microaggressions, sexism, racism, homophobia, whatever it might be. But if you document it, you'll see that there are patterns here, right? And so when you do, if you do decide to have a conversation with that person or HR, your manager, you can say, you know, I don't just feel like so-and-so was being sexist or racist. This is what happened at 1259 on Tuesday and again on Friday, you know, and you can actually see where it is. And it releases you from thinking that you've done something wrong. The next thing is redistribute that energy. I think many of us, when things happen to us in those settings and you're the only or one of few, you'll often say, um, did I do something wrong? Or you'll internalize it. And, and again, internalizing that negativity causes stress, which leads to chronic illness in many cases. And so um, redistribute that energy. Don't play it on a loop in your head what happened all day long, because guess what? That person who caused the harm, they're not thinking about you anymore. <laughs> They've moved on with their day. So don't allow yourself to let them run rent free in your mind. And then lastly, affirm yourself. Sometimes you won't have a colleague or a manager that's brave enough or courageous enough to call it out or do something about it, but you can affirm yourself. You didn't do anything to deserve it and you deserve humanity, dignity, equity, and respect, period. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I appreciate you laying out that framework for our audience and our community, because I think, you know, regardless of where you are, maybe you're in an entry level position, maybe you're in a management position, or even in that C-suite, right? There's all different scenarios we could find ourselves in that are beyond uncomfortable. They're not okay. And being able to vocalize that and have that record, like you had said, so that we don't have those questions of, did I imagine that? Did he, did he really say that? Or was that, you know, did I interpret that the wrong way? Um, I think that's so, so powerful. And that, that kind of you, I mean, you just laid out those words, those important words that I think you've echoed a lot in your writing, but humanity, dignity, equity, and respect are kind of, I think the groundwork for, you know, the, the movement that you've created. And, and I was curious, kind of piggybacking off of my last question, are there any coping mechanisms that have helped you to remind you that you, you are good enough to deserve all of those things that you are valuable? Because I think sometimes often we have these experiences, we internalize, and then we lose that sense of self-worth and self-confidence. I would imagine specifically for women of color, that's extraordinarily difficult because of these different racial adversities that many are facing in work settings. So can you touch on any coping mechanisms that have helped you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of them is that mindset shift, right? Back to your point of knowing that you're good enough to deserve it. Sometimes we've been in these situations and oftentimes depending on, I know for me being a first generation college student, I was just happy to be here. You know, I'm just <laughs> don't want to rock the boat. And so realizing that we all have worked very hard to get to whatever position, whatever level, uh, whatever rung on the ladder that we have. And so 
we owe it to ourselves. Part of that self-advocacy, part of that self-care is making sure that we create boundaries that center us. And so know that, um, I know I've been in a workplace where my colleagues can say whatever they want and nobody calls them angry or feisty or docile. And then the moment that someone of color says something, then all of a sudden they're aggressive, you know? And I, I've learned that the mindset shift is I can say what I mean without saying it mean. And that's one tool, right? Because oftentimes people don't even know what our boundary is because we've never established it. And then number two is our success is not a solo sport. You know, it's hard to heal alone. And so find communities like these, read books, podcast resources, so that you don't feel like you're alone because some, oftentimes we're suffering in silence and freedom can be found in the ecosystem. And so know that you're not alone. And I think that's half the battle is just thinking that you're alone and you're the only one dealing with this, but together we can find freedom. Thank you. That's, that's a really wonderful point as well, because I think in the, the day to day, it can feel really easy to, to feel that, that fatigue and that loneliness. And this is only happening to me, that weight of the world. Um, unfortunately, it's happening to a lot of, of people. I mean, I wish that wasn't the case, right? But that's the world that we live in. So finding those niche communities, like you said, um, that support system is extremely valuable. So thank you for that. Um, and, and, you know, you had touched on something that I wanted to ask you um, in a, a few questions from now, but I'll, I'll jump the gun now because you beautifully said it there. But that theme, saying what you mean without saying it mean, I love that. Uh, I think it's, it's so perfectly said, and it really reminds us the power of communicating our words. Our words matter, our words have weight. The way we speak to our colleagues matter, the way that our managers speak to us, or you know, vice versa, we speak to our teams matters. So what's your advice with that mentality in mind? How managers or leadership can best lead diverse teams to help everyone feels seen and heard? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, the main thing, in my opinion, is in order to create a good workplace, we have to get back to trust, right? Because a lot has happened in the last couple of years. And I think that just because we say a certain thing doesn't make it true, right? Just because we say psychological safety is here or you can be your authentic self doesn't mean that it's been demonstrated. And so for leaders and managers, I think it's really important right now to lean into your soft skills, but are, which are really leadership skills, like listening, <laughs> uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, when someone comes to you and says they have an issue, don't dismiss it. Your job is to remove the barrier, not create more. And I think we have to rebuild trust in the workplace because um, I'm never going to show up as my authentic self if I don't trust you as my manager, right? And so I think it's important that we go back to the basics, listening to each other, hearing each other out. I often talk about um, it takes courage for somebody to tell you how they're experiencing the workplace. Um, and they're telling you that because they want you to partner with them to try to remove that barrier. So think about that as a privilege. Thank you for telling me that. So now I can be a courageous listener and hear you out so that we can remove this barrier together. And I think if we try to make the workplace work for everybody, then that's seeing everyone's experiences um, and doing something about it because we all have a role to play. And I do believe managers have a really unique opportunity to make sure that everyone on their team feels seen, heard, and respected. Thank you. And that, it's definitely something that I want to point out that you'd noticed, or rather that you'd just pointed out a moment ago is just because you say there's equity or there's you know open listening or open communication doesn't mean <laughs> that it's there. We've seen that time and time again in the workplace. I know you've experienced it. I've certainly experienced that. So that being said, right now at this moment, it's 2022, uh, it feels like a majority of corporate America is trying, making an attempt uh, I don't want to do the air quotes, but you know, it's not always getting all the way that where it needs to be, but to create DEI efforts and some are really affecting actual change. They're getting feedback from uh, their team. They're, they're really having a collaborative approach. Others maybe are trying to do, duplicate something they've seen an initiative that they've seen work for other organizations, but it doesn't make the mark of being intentional or thoughtful. So my question to you is, how do you feel corporate America can gain that awareness to really create transformative DEI frameworks that make a difference? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of it is really going 
back again to those soft skills, leadership skills, I think oftentimes companies think they have to pour like millions of dollars into this thing, but it's actually the system that, and, and training that I think really helps. So for example, if you have a manager who is not comfortable managing women or they uh, aren't comfortable talking about race, that's, in my opinion, not someone that I would want managing a diverse team, managing at all, right? So we have to decide, do we have the right people leading us into the next century? And if not, who are those people? And again, I'm not saying we should throw managers out because they don't have certain competencies, but are we providing managers the tools and the training and the competencies so that their team benefits from that, right? And I think we have to look at leadership and management and take it very seriously because these are the people that are going to be a direct correlation to how you retain and attract diverse talent. And so I think, again, it can't just be on the website. It can't just be in the halls. It has to be in the demonstration. And I think that's, that's really key. And then I think the other thing is um, creating conflict. How do I say it? Creating mechanisms in which uh, employees, those who may be women of color or people of color or anyone, again, on the margins in the workplace, that they feel like their voices are seen without repercussion. Because I think for a very long time, women of color, people of color haven't been able to speak their truth about the workplace they are experiencing without fear of losing their job. And so again, I think we have to build trust. We have to create mechanisms where people feel safe to say how they feel, say what they mean without saying it mean, right? <laughs> without that fear. And so I just think we, I'm optimistic. We've done a lot of work to get to this point, but um, I think now we have to move from not just the conversation, but to the demonstration. Conversation to demonstration. I love that. I love that. Um, I, I did want to touch on earlier, you had referenced this, which is so important. And again, I think sort of a common thread with your writing and with your speaking engagements, but the concept of showing up as our authentic selves, we throw this phrase around a lot. It's used a lot in business, right? But I'm curious, what ways do you feel um, and maybe it, again, leaning on those soft listening skills, like you had mentioned earlier and touched on, which is so important. And I don't think people rely on enough, but what ways can we encourage specifically women of color to show up as their authentic selves instead of the version that maybe corporate America has traditionally been most comfortable with? Yeah. Um, I think in the theme of the demonstration, I think at every area of business and with the, within a company or organization, people have to be able to see themselves, right? So if I'm a woman of color in your organization, you're telling me that diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, all the letters are important, but I never see myself in leadership. I never see myself in the C-suite. I know the last time I went to HR, um, they dismissed my claims, right? You know, So if I'm experiencing at every turn that I'm not visible within this company, that my thoughts that my career doesn't matter to those who, who are saying these things, then I'm never going to feel like I can bring my authentic self to work because I don't see myself represented at work. And I think that's something that people have to think about. Um, it's hard to bring your authentic self when you don't see yourself there um, because now you are worried about what that could mean. And then uh, you have to keep educating everybody on what that means, depending on, you know, what uh, culture you come from. And so I think it's really important, again, to make sure that we are demonstrating that it's a safe place to bring yourself because you can just say it, but again, it might not be safe. And psychological safety doesn't happen just because we say it 10 times fast, right? <laughs> it, has to be, um, it has to be embedded in everything that we do. And lastly, the other part of this, if you are a woman of color and you're thinking about, oh, I want to be able to bring my authentic self to work, I want to challenge you to, to think about it differently what do I need to bring my healthiest self to work? Because if I'm healthy at work, then I'll bring those authentic pieces that I need. But if you're not in an environment where you can thrive and you're just surviving, then you're never going to be able to bring your true self and you're never going to be able to do the best work of your career. Absolutely. And maybe in those circumstances, it's time to look outside, you know, if you are not able to find that with that network of support, if that's not a possibility, maybe taking your skill set somewhere that you do feel valued. Absolutely. Um, we have a tiny bit of extra time left, which I'm shocked. So I, I do want to touch on your most uh, recent brilliant work, um, You Are More Than Magic. And I think 
if, if you don't mind just delving a little bit into that, I think what's really exciting about this piece that differentiates from your previous works is that this is really designed to speak to your younger self. So, you know, that almost that voice you wish you had when you were a girl growing up and you had that guiding light, um, maybe the reflection that you're able to gain now as an adult and with the experiences you've, you've had and acquired good and bad over the course of your life. Um, can you speak to that? Because I, I know that you're really proud of this work and I think our audience will be really excited to dive into it as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I am, I love all my book babies, but you know, You Are More Than Magic is a special book because uh, it is reminding our young adults that they belong already, right? There's nothing wrong with them. And I think because they get early um, doses of um, demeaning who they are, silencing their voices, right? Um, I think that all of that, we take that into adulthood with us. And I thought about myself, a lot of the things that I experienced in corporate America, how I saw myself, some of that imposter syndrome, it didn't start what when I entered into corporate America, it started way before that, you know, and I look back at my teen years and I thought, wow, I silenced myself at 14. I silenced myself at 16. And so I don't want our young girls or our young boys or our young royals <laughs> to, to have to think about silencing their self right now. I want them to be able to have the tools in their toolkit that they can advocate for themselves, even with an adult, right? Just because we don't grow up in some of us don't grow up in families where communication is healthy, doesn't mean that they can't be healthy communicators, right? Giving them the tools to be able to say what they mean without saying it mean, giving them the tools to say, okay, well, if somebody is, doesn't wanna sit with me in the lunchroom, doesn't mean something's wrong with me, right? And I think we just have to remind them that they, they are more than magic, that being magic, um, you know, we say black girl magic and it's a fun thing to say, but there's nothing magical about being who we are in this world. Right? It takes grit, it takes determination, it takes love, and it takes affirmation. And um, I just want our girls to know that they have everything they need already inside of them and that we're here to catch them if and when they fall, but we're here to lift them up so that they can be their best selves. Again, thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Um, and you know, the last thing I would just say is uh, we all have a voice. You just have to decide how you want to use it. So never think that you don't have a voice. We all have a piece to play to make things better than we found it. And I hope that you'll consider what your piece of this puzzle is. Thank you so much, Minda. And I hope that we'll have many conversations in the future with you.